Thanks very much, Joel. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another AJAC webinar with our special guest tonight, Olga Deutsch. Uh, as Joel said, she's Vice President of NGO Monitor, headed up by a very good friend, of course, Professor Gerald Steinberg, who spoke to us a couple of months ago. Uh, now, Olga has spoken to many of our rum groups in Israel and always makes a very positive impression. She's really an expert on the funding of highly politicised organisations and government agencies and bodies like UNRWA that unfortunately drive a very problematic agenda on Israel, designed to delegitimise Israel and often spilling over effectively into the support of terrorism and anti-Semitism. The BDS movement, for example, is in that category. She has a record of working very closely with elected officials in many countries and uh, Indeed, government uh, decision makers and uh, uh, people in broader elite positions really do need to understand uh, this state of affairs, this totally unsatisfactory state of affairs. And uh, we need to understand it and we need advice on how to cope with it, to contest it, to minimize the damage these organizations do. So uh, as an expert in advocacy and in developing strategies to expose and undermine these attempts to delegitimize Israel. Olga has certainly made a mark, certainly with us, with AJAC and uh, our visitors to Israel and internationally. And we're delighted she's agreed to talk to us tonight on this uh, topic, following the money trail and insight into the funding of terrorism and anti-Semitism. Olga, welcome and the screen is yours. Well, thank you so much for this amazing introduction and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, with you today, hopefully someday soon in person <laughs> in Israel or in, uh, in Australia. But in the meantime, in our uh, weird COVID reality, this is, uh, this is an incredible opportunity to see many of the friends. Uh, um, NGO Monitor has been blessed with uh, an amazing uh, partnership with AJAC over the years, obviously uh, spearheaded by uh, uh, Colin and our president, Gerald. Uh, Professor Gerald Steinberg, but I am happy to uh, to extend it also in a personal capacity. Um, Joel and I go way back, so this uh, this is uh, even closer to my heart. Thank you, uh, Colin. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, I promise to make a special hi to some special people in the audience as well on your end, like the Miller family. <laughs> uh, uh, a lot of friends uh, that I, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to be with uh, today. Um, the, the topic that I would like to talk is somewhat a complicated one. Um, it is, uh, we're we, we deal with an issue that, um, that is seemingly uh, the organizations that seemingly only do good, right? Every time when we talk about great human rights and humanitarian groups such as Amnesty International or Oxfam or Human Rights Watch or in Australian uh, context, uh, World Vision, we are geared to, we were raised to believe that they do well. I mean, this was, uh, this was the ultimate expression of the grassroots uh, um, uh, movement and the will for each one of us through their individual uh, uh, contributions be able to, um, you know, help uh, people in remote places do good, uh, deal with uh, famine, diseases, all the way to promote human rights, build sustainable democracies, uh, and so on. And what we find ourselves at NGO Monitor is actually trying to raise awareness that these groups sometimes, and in the context of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, more often than not, promote exactly the opposite values to the ones that we would like them uh, to do. And um, in order to, uh, this is obviously met uh, oftentimes with uh, very strong reactions, because again, we're not used to uh, taking a critical look at how um, these groups uh, operate and what, and what they do. Um, and in order to try to um, convey uh, the gravity of the situation to you better, I always say that a, a, a picture tells a thousand words. So I have decided to share a few slides with you just to be better uh, able to um, uh, illustrate uh, the magnitude of the, uh, the challenge that we face. Um, so here we go. 
Can you see that? Okay, very good. So very briefly, NGO Monitor is a research uh, organization founded by Professor Gerald Steinberg in 2002. Until today, uh, we have uh, our, our employee number range between 15 and 20 uh, plus. And we look at the activities of so-called human rights and humanitarian groups that in one way or another focus on the um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We have a database of around 250 uh, groups, some of them uh, Palestinian, some Israeli, many of them global, European, Amnesty, CARE, uh, World Vision, and so on. Uh, we are an UN ECOSOC uh, accredited organization, which gives us a special opportunity to also bring our research uh, within the UN uh, institutions, bring guests, file submissions, and so on. Uh, because as many of you know, UN is one of the great scenes where a lot of the pro-Israel advocacy work uh, takes place. And one important thing to mention just about our work before we dig into the, uh, the actual uh, topic is that all our information, and we make this a matter of principle, is based on open source uh, information. Meaning, when we raise awareness with donor governments uh, who fund many of these groups, we, we do that by saying the information that we found could easily be found by you. Uh, we don't have any special uh, intelligence or research uh, capacity. Let me try to frame uh, the, the issue uh, in numbers. Uh, according to the OSCD, and these are the last available figures, but they portray the, the picture quite well in the problem. In 2011, around uh, more than 19 billion US dollars uh, was channeled through official development assistance um, uh, provided by 30, uh, they call it DAC member states, that's Development Assistance Committee, which is basically the 30 uh, countries of the developed world, the European uh, Union countries, Australia, US, you have the table, Japan, and so on. Um, the, 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 out of this, 14 and a half percent was provided to and through non-governmental organizations, NGOs. That is an incredible amount. Uh, on a bilateral level, 20 percent of the aid uh, was provided through or to NGOs. On top of that, when we say official aid, that means that every country uh, in its annual budget allocates a certain percentage um, to development and cooperation aid. Uh, but on top of that, the NGOs in these 30 countries were able in 2011 to raise an additional at least 32 billion US dollars from private sources. Altogether, this amounts to more than 50 billion US dollars that in aid that was channeled only through NGOs. This is just to understand the volume, the scope of the issue that uh, we are dealing with. These groups, as you can see, um, operate, some of them, incredible budgets. The Oxfam budget in 2018 was around 1 billion euros. Uh, Amnesty International uh, 2017 annual budget was uh, nearly 300 million uh, dollars and so on and so on. This, this gives them um, incredible resources, sometimes even greater than certain states might have. And at the same time, they enjoy incredible political uh, influence and they, they enjoy incredible political stage and platform. Um, uh, they, the, the public trust that is given to them uh, is probably parallel to none other. Um, while at the same time, as opposed to the private sector or the governmental sector, they do not, uh, they do not owe any checks or balancing. Most of them don't have democratic internal processes, no elections, only professional appointments. Um, and oftentimes their activities are not transparent. They claim to be operating in the uh, interest of the, pub, of the broader public, while at the same time, and again, as opposed to governments or the private sector, the public does not have access to uh, where the money went to, which type of projects exactly were supported, 
which partners uh, they partnered locally with. And this on its own, this is not to say that all the non-governmental organizations are um, problematic, on the contrary, but it, but it does show uh, that there's a lot of gray areas and that these groups are very often left vulnerable, especially when operating in conflict uh, uh, ridden areas. In the Palestinian context and, context, and this is zooming, starting to zoom into our issue, we estimate, and this is a very conservative uh, estimate, that at least uh, 100 million US dollars annually is uh, uh, channeled to NGOs from different uh, donor governments, um, to NGOs active in the context of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, conflict. The, most of the NGOs operating within the con conflict are extremely governmental donor uh, dependent. Uh, I, I found out a few days ago a new study by a, by a Palestinian academic who did a survey of 33 Palestinian NGOs, which is a quite good uh, sample. There's not that many. And in, um, uh, it found that 80, nearly 88% of their funding uh, comes from European governments, placing the EU and the European governments as, uh, as their number one uh, donor. What our research shows is that many of these groups, instead of promoting human rights or humanitarian causes or focusing on what they're claimed to, to, uh, to have as their agenda, which is building the Palestinian uh, uh, society as a sustainable one, they promote BDS, they promote anti-Semitism using old fashioned anti-Semitic tropes, but absolutely embracing all the forms of the new, the modern anti-Semitism. Many of them incite to violence or glorify it. And in certain cases, some of these groups have direct ties to designated terror organizations. And with this, I would like to actually dive into the uh, specific examples, and this will probably uh, be the best uh, way to, uh, to illustrate the challenge. Take a look at this image, okay? Amnesty International uh, sponsored in 2015 uh, a speaking tour for Bassem Tamimi. This is Manal Tamimi's father, the infamous Manal Tamimi that was in prison. Um, he himself was convicted in 2012 for uh, encouraging Palestinian youth to throw stones at Israeli soldiers and organize uh, demonstrations and so on. He was, uh, uh, his tour was sp uh, sponsored in the States and the tour included school uh, lectures. He spoke to third graders in a New York State uh, uh, school and basically called them to join the Palestinian fight and cause uh, by embracing and being the freedom fighters to Palestine. Um, consequently, the principal of the school uh, went public and denounced it and said that this was an unacceptable uh, content to be uh, delivered to a third grade. I, I have a second grade son. I mean, to, to, to imagine the situation where third grade students in a New York uh, school are exposed to this content that they don't understand what it is, uh, is just beyond imagination. But beyond that, uh, Basim Tamimi frequently on his social media shared anti-Semitic tropes like the one you see on the left-hand side of the, of the uh, slide, uh, basically uh, promoting uh, a classic trope that uh, Israeli soldiers uh, steal uh, organs of Palestinian kids and trade them and so on. And this was endorsed and school sponsored by the greatest human rights and humanitarian group out there, Amnesty International. This year, earlier this year, Oxfam, another major uh, global uh, charity, uh, in its online store offered for all for the eight pounds, British pounds, Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler. And it took us, NGO Monitor, more than one attempt uh, to get them to, to take it down. We wrote to them uh, uh, once, and they said it being dealt with. And, all, and we, we found out that it wasn't. It was still available. 
And only after we insisted again, did they take it down and uh, tweeted an apology uh, saying that this was unacceptable. But the fact that this was that this went through internal Oxfam uh, staff, senior staff and approvals and that no one thought, and this is UK, right? This is not remote, this is Europe, continental Europe, understand very, very well what Adolf Hitler and Mein Kampf stand for, is uh, showed yet again how vulnerable these groups are. Let's take a look at the Palestinian groups. Uh, a quite uh, a big Palestinian uh, uh, organization that deals with, uh, provides medical relief, um, both in the West Bank and in Gaza. Um, in, in one of their annual bulletins, as they call them, uh, used Latouf, a famous Palestinian uh, caricature, uh, caricaturist, his caricatures, and I, I believe I don't have to explain the images because the, the clear references to the Holocaust and to the gas chambers and um, the concentration camps are simply horrific. And if we were to pull the uh, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance uh, working definition of anti-Semitism, this would definitely uh, constitute a clear anti-Semitic case. Yet this group is funded by Sweden, the EU, the United Nations, France, and many other countries. And more than that, and this is one uh, important uh, 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 comment I would like to make, money is only the beginning of the, of the issue. And to my mind, personally, I don't think it's the greatest, a much graver uh, a phenomenon here is being created, and that is that when this group uh, can put EU's logo or Sweden uh, Crown's logo uh, or the UN's emblem uh, on its programming, it goes way beyond the funding that they enjoy from these uh, governments. It gives them incredible legit legitimacy and an and incredible platform because their head is, for example, being frequently uh, hosted by the Swedish government in the parliament. And this is how these group, groups also end up influencing uh, policies and end up being uh, uh, sourced as uh, credible or quoted as credible sources of information. Um, another example is um, uh, Women's Center for Legal Aid and Counseling, a Palestinian women organization whose uh, senior official was repeatedly, this was not a one-off occasion, but repeatedly uh, fought on her Twitter account, social media, tweeting uh, horrific anti-Semitic uh, content. Uh, I do hate Israel, I do hate Zionism, I wish a third intifada coming soon, and people raise up and kill all these Zionist settlers everywhere. The lower one says vampire Zion is celebrating their Kibora, which is the Yom Kippur, um, day by drinking Palestinian bloods and so on and so on. But this doesn't end here. In 2017, the United Nations, um, uh, the United Nations nominated her as one of their human rights defenders. Every year, the United Nations have announces a list of uh, major uh, human rights defenders that they award. Um, and it took a, a campaign uh, led by us to get, uh, to get this uh, person off that list. Um, one last uh, uh, slide about the uh, anti-Semitic uh, activities of some of these groups. Um, actually, I wanted to share uh, with you um, the fact that during the COVID, uh, the, uh, the number and the um, uh, the, how great the anti-Semitic tropes were only went up. And I guess uh, it is easy to explain in any crisis, as we uh, unfortunately know, Jews uh, are the first ones to blame. And uh, in our modern reality, Israel is bundled with that. So we saw an increase in uh, uh, NGO anti-Semitic uh, narratives where uh, Israel was compared with or blamed uh, for anything creating the coronavirus, deliberately spreading it uh, uh, to the Palestinians and so on, um, as well as demonized for you know, uh, exposing them deliberately on purpose, uh, not providing aid or stopping aid from coming in, etc. 
And you see on the screen many of the caricatures that accompany this that were uh, that were shared by many of the Palestinian groups. Um, but we saw this also um, elsewhere, not only amongst the Palestinian groups. Uh, you have uh, in the lower uh, image uh, a, a Facebook post by a Spanish group, Solidarita con Palestina, which stands for obviously uh, Palestine Solidarity, that blamed Israel for deliberately sending uh, inf COVID infected doctors to treat Palestinian prisoners. And at the same time, we had a Palestinian uh, uh, organization that um, deals, focuses on uh, Palestinian prisoners' rights. And in, at the same breath, they were blaming Israel for. Uh, not providing COVID treatment to Palestinian prisoners, but at the same time for closing the prisoner prisons so that there's no exposure, because in that way they were uh, they were not able to meet with the prisoners and collect their stories of how how the Israelis violate their rights. So it was it was almost a schizophrenic thing, but one thing is for sure there was an obsession about blaming Israel and and just taking it to the next uh, level, using COVID as another way to, um, to blame Israel and, and, uh, and the Jews. One other uh, extremely worrisome uh, way, uh, phenomenon that we see is, as I mentioned, is many of these groups have ties to terror. And I'd like to offer a few examples on that too. Many of you probably rem remember that in August uh, last year, 2019, there was a horrific uh, terror attack that took place in the outskirts of Jerusalem, where the 17-year-old Marina Schneer was uh, hiking with her father and brother, and um, a PFLP, uh, an EU, US, Canada, Israel, a designated terror organization, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, uh, took uh, credit. Um, and there was a, they detonated an explosive and Rina was unfortunately uh, murdered. Uh, the Israeli security forces uh, announced uh, late in 2019, uh, a list of 15 members of this terror, of the terror link uh, that was a uh, uh, terror cell that was responsible for the, uh, uh, for the attack. And horrifically enough, amongst the 50 arrested, at least five senior current and former employees of three major Palestinian NGOs uh, were in the list. For years, we have been trying to show uh, direct or indirect links and flirting, if you'd like, uh, between um, NGO officials, uh, both on the board members and uh, employees and PFOP. But this, when this went public, this was an eye opener because we saw that their financial directors and uh, executive directors were played a senior role in, uh, in a terror attack. Let me uh, share with you how senior. So the human uh, the health work committees, uh, which is one of the NGO, Palestinian NGOs, their financial and administrative director, meaning the person who operates the funds, um, he was the one who, stand, who stood trial for uh, basically commanding the military operation uh, and the bank rolling the bombing. And um, this is a person who was also previously convicted for his PFOP activism. Samer Arbi, who served as the uh, uh, financial officer for another one of the biggest Palestinian organizations, the Union of Agricultural Work Committees, which it's, a, it's an agricultural organization that PFOP says is its agricultural affiliate. It says so on the PFOP's website. Uh, he was charged on uh, detonating the explosive uh, device. He too already was placed in administrative detention in 20, back in 2015. And the third one who worked for a third organization, Bissan, uh, was uh, uh, set, stood trial for recruiting uh, additional members of the cell. So we're, on one hand, we see senior NGO officials and then taking senior roles in committing the terror attack. To put this in a, in a, in a context, at least 
25, 28, sorry, uh, million US dollars uh, was provided uh, to eight terror linked NGOs, Palestinian NGOs in four years alone from the European government. Um, in when we took a span of uh, almost like nine years, 2011 to 2019, the last available figures, it was at least $44 million that went to 11 groups. Most of these groups um, have their budgets, the biggest ones have their budgets somewhere between half a million and a million euros, and that's only two of them. Most of them are somewhere in the range between a hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, just to get to, to to sort of put this in the scope. Um, interestingly enough, not surprisingly, however, uh, the PA itself took uh, this uh, this uh, because the whole issue of Rina Schneider's murder resonated uh, uh, strongly in Israel. Uh, the uh, Israeli Minister of Foreign Affairs summoned the EU ambassador over this and summoned another three ambassadors, European ambassadors this year. Uh, and there was a very, very, uh, uh, very public campaign calling for the EU and other European governments to freeze their funding and to investigate. In response, the Palestinian uh, authority together with the PFOP and Palestinian civil society opened in a public they call it national campaign, rejecting um, funding conditionality, as they call it. Uh, we have uh, we saw a statement by Peter Kofi itself uh, calling for national unity, as well as the Palestinian Authority threatening to sanction, to find those uh, and prosecute those NGOs who accept the so-called EU anti-terror requirements. So, so what we sort of see is. PFOP and Fatah and Islamic Jihad, which are all EU, for example, designated organizations, sort of using the NGOs as an extended arm to both get official aid funds, monies from Europe and the United uh, Nations, as well as use this as a political vehicle to promote what seems to be a Palestinian uh, 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 agenda. And it's an agenda of anti-normalization, rejectionism, violence and so on. A little bit about the Australian uh, context before I wrap it up and open for questions because I know from Joel that there's a, there will be a, quite a lot of uh, questions and I'm happy to, uh, uh, to engage in a, in a discussion. Um, I am not sure that I will be uh, uh, sharing much news to you, uh, but I think it's interesting just to put it all in one uh, place. Um, and this is just you know snips of what happened in the last uh, uh, three years. Uh, in 2016, there was the, the, the huge scandal over World Vision's uh, Gaza director, who was accused of diverting World Vision's uh, money uh, to Hamas. Uh, consequently, Australia, Germany, and UK, who all fund uh, World Vision, um, uh, suspended funding. Uh, there was a whole issue uh, because World Vision and uh, Mohammed El Halabi's uh, lawyer until today claims actually the figures don't add up um, uh, because uh, the Israeli security uh, uh, apparatus blamed him for diverting some 50 million uh, US dollars over 10 years, but World Vision officials claim that the total uh, World Vision budget in Gaza was 20 two and a half million over 10 years. But actually we found out that the Israeli World Vision entity reported in 2014 alone an annual budget of 16.3 million. So there's, there's a lot of uh, discrepancy. Um, the trial is still ongoing. The El Halabi's uh, lawyer con continues to uh, file complaints that the trial is not public, that it is that he is um, not allowed to enter Gaza, he's not allowed to bring uh, to the trial uh, certain uh, uh, witnesses, and the Israeli security uh, apparatus keeps saying that obviously a lot of the information is confidential. It has been a controversial trial, a lot of it behind the closed doors, and we're still waiting to see um, what will come out of it. In 2018, AFEDA, which is the, uh, the major Australian uh, 
aid uh, group affiliated to the, to the unions, uh, was caught in a terror scandal. Uh, Afeda uh, funds uh, one of the biggest Palestinian uh, human rights groups, Man Development Center, and one of their employees was shot during the Gaza border violence in, 2000, in the summer of 2018. Um, and he was identified by Israeli security forces as, um, as an activist of uh, Hamas armed branch. Um, Afeda enjoys some 40% of its uh, core funding uh, from Australian aid, which sort of makes it in the way, the way we in Tangier Monitor look at these issues, that almost makes it a, we call it an indirect governmental funding because more, a lot of the funding comes from the government. So um, Australian aid uh, also ran an internal audit. And then this year, I'm sure I will, I'm not uh, sharing any, anything new to you. World Vision was again caught in, a, uh, in an ugly scandal over uh, corruption, nepotism, bribes, and so on. Interestingly, um, all these uh, internal audits and investigations uh, found no evidence. Uh, but one thing is for sure, that again, this, these incidents and scandals point to how fragile the charities and the non-governmental uh, organizations are, particularly when they operate in conflict-ridden areas and that there is not enough oversight of how they choose their partners, who they work with. Um, th this is, uh, uh, I took a look uh, to be very prepared before our, uh, before this webinar on the Australian AIDS website. And, and, and it show, again, points to the same thing. Over the last five years, Australia uh, will have provided 14 million Australian dollars uh, to, to PA. And that includes also funding to NGOs. Um, and the only information that we have that is displayed there is that this will be provided to major Australian charities World Vision, CARE, uh, AFEDA, and so on. But we, we have no idea which particular project, we have no idea who are their local partners and, uh, and which of them uh, gets how much money, which again, leaves all of them very fragile. To sum up, what do we do with all this information? So um, it's sort of split into two. On one hand, we call for our governments to cut funds to, uh, to specific NGOs, uh, when we have uh, clear evidence that the NGOs uh, breached their code of conduct or, uh, or their proclaimed agenda, whether it is uh, BDS, anti-Semitism, or terror ties. And I can share with you that in the last 10 years, uh, uh, what we could count, it's not always easy, we cut off over 53 million US dollars from NGOs promoting uh, BDS, anti-Semitism, old or new, or some of the terror-linked uh, groups. And at the same time, and this is probably even more important than the fund cuts, because if you only raise awareness with a donor government and you say, look at this NGO, uh, it is promoting anti-Semitism, and then the government says, okay, this is really grave, we will freeze our funding. Um, this is not uh, addressing the issue from its core, because unless there is a policy uh, remedy or a change that um, prevents this from happening in the future, then we haven't really done much other than uh, treat the problem at that very moment. So the other uh, big area of our activities is uh, calling for governments to adopt much more specific and clear um, policies, as well as implement them whether it is guidelines or, you know, in the context of anti-Semitism, adopt the IRA uh, working definition on, on anti-Semitism, but is also implement them. Our research shows that most of the governments, somewhere between different legislations and, you know, contractual uh, requirements uh, or guidelines, they do have uh, uh, specific requirements of their uh, NGO grantees, but the major challenge is how they vet uh, their vetting processes and implementing applying sanctions and so on. But in the last two years alone, we managed to get, for example, uh, the attention of the EU, Swiss government, Denmark, Netherlands, 
Germany and Norway, just to give you a few examples, in which cases they adopted specific uh, guidelines on NGO funding. This year alone, we cut uh, almost 4 million US dollars from problematic NGOs. Uh, a major thing is that the US State Department declared uh, BDS as anti-Semitic, including specific language that they say the US will not fund uh, pro-BDS NGOs. Um, US is not alone in this. Uh, Germany already uh, uh, adopted the same thing uh, a year and a half ago, calling BDS anti-Semitic and also addressing the funding specifically. Uh, this year, the French Prime Minister's office also said that the French government will be applying the IRA working definition specifically on uh, the NGOs that they uh, uh, fund. Um, our research was used by Prime Minister Netanyahu, by Defense Minister and Alternative Prime Minister uh, uh, Benny Gantz. Um, we are currently in the midst of a review done by the Dutch government, by the European Union, just to give you a, uh, an idea of how our research is, uh, is used. Uh, and with this, I would like to finish my presentation. Joe, I hope I didn't exceed my uh, allocated time by, by, by much more than I usually do and is uh, academically uh, <laughs> uh, acceptable. And I am, again, thank you for, for having me. And I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear your questions and, and, uh, uh, and, and have a discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. I'll just, uh, great. So I'll, we will now hand over to the audience. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can utilize the raised hand feature inside Zoom. To do that, you'll see a participant tab on the bottom of your screen if you're using a desktop computer, if not on the top of your screen if you're using a mobile device. At the bottom of the list of the participants, you'll see a raised hand button. You can click that and we will receive a silent notification of your intention to ask a question. I'd now like to hand over to Gary Hertz to kick us off for tonight. Um, you spoke about government, lobbying governments about um, the funding for these uh, NGOs that um, fund Pal Palestinian terrorism. What about um, litigation, uh, individual litigation, where um, people have been wounded or, or killed? Um, do you deal with that? Do you investigate that and pass it on to, um, to maybe some law firms or whatever representing them so to be able to, tr to try and recover damages? against uh, these NGOs? So that's, that's an excellent question. Um, at, we at NGO Monitor, we focus on uh, working with, uh, with governments and holding them accountable. Um, so that we, we, we call for them to implement the, the, the existing policies. Um, and we, we, we use the research to to get them to review, okay, and hold them accountable, not give to dividends. At the same time, there's a there's a, exactly that aspect that you mentioned because there's the victim side of it, um, and um, we work with uh, many groups of lawyers who use that information um, in both in European countries. There's Israeli groups. Um, and a lot of the funding information, but more than that, understanding the legislation in each of the uh, European or other countries uh, that we have is pivotal for them uh, building their cases. For example, I'll give you an illustration. The European Union um, uh, or its executive arm, the European Commission in 2018 added a new contractual requirement, a new clause in their uh, contracts with Palestinian, with NGOs around the world, by the way, that said uh, EU will not give money to NGOs who have their uh, officials, uh, activists, board members, or even third parties enjoying their workshops and so on, on the EU terrorist, the EU list of design, designated uh, terrorist organizations. And um, this was a new requirement, but it takes uh, expertise in understanding its legal uh, uh, consequences and ramifications. And 
The problem with this is that on paper, it sounds amazing, but in effect, it has zero impact on what happens because the list of EU terrorist organizations and individuals has, um, it's a mixture of terror groups and individuals until, it, until we get to the Palestinian issue. There is not a single Palestinian individual on the list. So what happens is that you can try to uh, uh, employ this uh, uh, clause, but in the Palestinian context, it really means nothing because you can't prosecute PFOP. It's also a political party and there are no individuals. So none of them are held accountable. So we do work, we, we use that expertise and the knowledge that we have and the funding uh, information and we cooperate with lawyers around the world uh, because many of many of them actually are uh, instead of going to governments and ministries, they, they turn to police and the terror focused uh, uh, law enforcement uh, agencies. I don't know if that answers the question because it's a, it's a tricky one. It's really finding the legal niche where this can be uh, uh, pursued. Thank you, Olga. Now I'll hand over to Ajax Naomi Levine. Hi, Olga. Thank you very much. And thank you also for all NGO Monitors research. We draw on it a lot at AJAC and it's incredibly useful. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to raise a problem we often have in Australia is that we get a very sympathetic hearing when we go to government and tell them about these organisations and their, their record and um, what we know about them. But the next question, the follow up is always, well, tell us who we can donate to, who are the safe organisations, where should we be giving the money to because we want to support the Palestinian people and create a viable future Palestinian state. How would you answer that question when it's posed to you? Well, that's another uh, a excellent question and because we also get it all the time. Uh, when I encounter, when I engage with uh, decision makers, uh, the more friendly and the more open ones will say, okay, so tell me who to work with. Uh, there's a huge challenge with whitelisting. I don't think anyone, we most certainly don't do that, but there is no way that any one group or entity uh, can hold you know, a rolling list of Palestinian and other NGOs and then check on regular basis that they're okay, because you are then taking responsibility for saying that okay in a group. And, and we live in, in a world that is much more dynamic than it's, it wouldn't be realistic. But it's more than that. And um, I don't think that, uh, that that should be our job or the job of any one government. You cannot control everyone out there, okay? That's why we call it a civil society. And, and in an open democracy, anyone, if I manage to raise funds and you know, uh, uh, get enough attention around the issues that I promote, as long as I'm not violating any laws in the country, right? I should be free to operate. But there's a huge difference between that and what a government that channels taxpayers' money should fund and give platform to. So what we say is that uh, yours is not to prove that this or that group is okay. Yours is to set the boundaries of what is not okay for the Australian government to support. And this is why we, we, we tell all decision makers, adopt specific guidelines demand certain standards. And then when the, when the Palestinian or any other NGO does not live up to that, it is not your fault because you requested it. Yours is to merely implement the guidelines, meaning when, you're, you're, when the attention is raised to a breach, then you, you, know, you run an audit or you have a sanction or you condemn it or whatever it will be. But yours is to say, this is the this is where uh, this is where our support ends because this is not compatible with our values. I always um, um, I always actually use uh, my own background to illustrate this. Uh, I'm originally from Serbia, okay, and I was in Serbia when we were taking down uh, as students as civil activists we were taking down a dictator Milosevic, right? And what we saw then is uh, in a country that was not a democracy, okay? All of a sudden we saw a, uh, a birth, it wasn't even a revival, a birth of civil society. We had NGOs being created like mushrooms after rain. And most of them, by the way, funded and supported by the same actors that we are, that I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with now. Anything from German political foundations to 
you know, uh, donor governments and, and different foundations. But one of the big lessons that I took from that uh, uh, back then, and, and, and I take this with me and I share this with you, official, the, the, the easy uh, lesson uh, about democracy is what are my rights? Lesson about democracy starts with my responsibilities and my duties. And this is even more the case with civil society. If I have a, uh, an NGO that I want to operate in human rights and humanitarian uh, arena, then the first question is what are my obligations? What are the standards I need to live up to? What I get and what I deserve is the easy part. That's the point that everyone gets within five minutes. So going back to your question, as long as the, uh, the, the, the governments have clear uh, boundaries and standards and guidelines of what, what is not okay, the responsibility is with the, with the recipients, with the NGOs. Thank you, Olga. I'll now hand over to Svi Fleischer. Hi, Olga. Thank you very much for your, your, your presentation and the good work you do. Um, I want to ask about the European policy of, of funding um, what are essentially Palestinian construction in Area C in violation of the Oslo Accords. Um, that, uh, that Israel, I mean, obviously it's, it's illegal under Israeli law, the European, and the Europeans are essentially demanding, when Israel demolishes the stuff they build, that the Europeans are essentially demanding compensation from Israel for it. Um, is, this, is this increased as a result of the sort of UAE, EU dissatisfaction with the Trump administration? And might it go away if it, it did? And is there, is there anything that can be done by Israel or by civil society groups about this very problematic activity by the EU? Oh, wow. <laughs> that topic could be a, a webinar session on its own. Uh, it is a controversial issue both uh, in Europe and here in Israel. Unfortunately, it is also painted here in Israel in a partisan way because the, the internal discussions in the Knesset will usually, you know, uh, be polarized between the, the right and the center right and the left or center left parties in Israel. Um, and there will be very little consensus on that. I think it's too early to say whether there was an increase in the aftermath of the Abraham Accords in the UAE, uh, because we have, you know, it's been only a few months and uh, uh, the funding mechanisms operate differently, meaning they, the EU and other governments, or Australia as well, they will. Uh, the, the, the groups enjoy the funding that was awarded basically last year. So we might see uh, um, uh, results of that in 2021, you know, the, uh, in the grants that will be allocated in 2021. One thing is for sure, it is definitely a political scene for, uh, for uh, European donor governments. They see it as a, um, uh, they see it as a, as, as a, I'm trying to use to choose my words carefully. <laughs> um, it, it's a clear advocacy and political activity uh, area and a strategic one for the EU. Uh, we have seen that particularly the EU and the Netherlands, for example, um, they will fund Palestinian groups to map uh, territories in the area C, then build things which then the IDF demolishes. So it's like a vicious circle, but then it creates a, a whole campaign, you know, for the Palestinian groups over something that a building that very often the case was not even there to begin with. Uh, only last week, there was a hearing in the uh, Knesset uh, Foreign Affairs uh, and Defense Committee on this. Um, from what we are here gathering, this will be an issue uh, for the Israeli government. Um, I cannot tell you whether uh, it will be dealt with in a statement way, because again, the internal Israeli discourse is a whole separate uh, game, obviously now that we, it seems like we are headed into yet another round of elections. Um, and we all know what happens in free election campaigns, but it is a, a hot political issue. Um, uh, and it's not a it's it's not the only one. I can tell you that we released a report uh, early September analyzing specifically EU funding uh, to NGOs operating in East Jerusalem, um, and we found projects that state the following. For example, um, the project will uh, promote preserving the Palestinian identity of East Jerusalem and defending. 
protecting the Palestinian uh, cultural and religious heritage against the Israeli uh, uh, attacks. I mean, this is a project funded by the EU. Uh, we find this kind of language also in EU official uh, strategic documents for, for Palestine, as they call it. So it's a huge issue. There's the Palestinian terror groups, it's a separate issue, and usually that's the one that we can agree uh, much easier with the European donor governments with because it's terror. But the, everything that has to do with East Jerusalem and Area C is much, much more uh, uh, controversial. And I think we will see a lot of uh, back and forth uh, between uh, Israel and uh, Europe. Um, I also got involved with the whole Abraham Accords. I'm a member of the uh, Gulf Israel Business Club and the UAE Israel uh, Women Initiative. So we have been discussing this issue a lot, uh, particularly because the Abraham Accords changed uh, a regional paradigm. What used to be an Arab-Israeli conflict is no longer that. It's now, uh, it's been diminished to Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we see Arab states critically looking at uh, what the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian policies and politics. And we have heard uh, encouraging and promising signs from the UAE uh, that they would be interested uh, in also addressing the UNRWA funding to the Palestinians um, and uh, you know textbooks and so on, because they don't, they too, as a donor as well, they don't see, they don't look favorably to incitement that is prevalent in Palestinian textbooks uh, and, and, in, and in general in the society, in media, and so on. Uh, the tricky part is the absence of the European um, reaction whatsoever. The only thing that came from the European capitals and from Brussels was a vague, you know, uh, uh, statement uh, that was not. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't doing justice to how historic these agreements are, regardless of the conflict, right? Um, and we have seen in the last couple of months that the, very little has come from Brussels. And in my conversations with the members of the European Parliament and so on. Part of this also comes from their lack of understanding of what this really means geopolitically now for the region. It's really redefining uh, the paradigm. And while it poses a challenge, I personally believe this, this is also a tremendous opportunity uh, to engage in a different way, to redefine also how we advocate, uh, not, not, not only for Israel, but how we advocate for, uh, for the uh, Europe-Israel relation. And moreover, there is sort of a new corridor, the regional corridor that is being created. And unless Europe jumps, in, jumps on and joins the, the ride, it will be a missed opportunity for both uh, Europe and Israel, I think. It was, this was a, a big answer to a, a big question. <laughs> no, we appreciate it, Olga. Thank you for that. I'll now like to hand over to Richard Rogers. Hi, Olga. Thank you. Uh, very much for your talk tonight. It's it's disturbing and but clearly very realistic. I'd like you to gather together your your perception with a crystal ball and look forward, sort of ten years, twenty years, given the speedy rise of anti-Semitism around the world and the intransigence intransigence of a lot of the European nations, particularly towards Israel, where, where do you think we are heading in this situation? Well, uh, I, I, while not pretending that I actually have a crystal ball, <laughs> I think uh, one, of the, one of the challenges is that we live in such turbulent times where uh, things that we could not imagine 10 years ago are actually happening in front of our eyes for better and for worse. Uh, you know, on one hand, we have the Abraham Accords, which is really feeling like we are living the history. But at the same time, we have the incredible um, divisions with, within societies globally. This is not a, a European thing or an Israeli thing. Uh, the, uh, the Trump administration that was incredible for Israel uh, at the same time, um, brought up 
incredible divisions within the U.S. society, and now with the um, with Biden uh, Biden's election, uh, everyone is asking the question: What's next? Uh, we'll all uh, all the incredible work for Israel, right? That uh, Trump administration did will be annulled or erased. What you know? What uh, what can be expected? It's um, it's a it's a complex one. Um, I think there will be a, an attempt to reintroduce some of the things by the Biden administration. This is, but again, this is my personal uh, uh, sort of cautious analysis. For example, I, I do uh, think that some of the aid, the PA, uh, probably also UNRWA will be reintroduced. Uh, we can probably expect the, that the Palestinian consulate will be reopened in DC. Um, but at the same time, I don't think that all of it will. Uh, will I don't think that, um, uh, you know, dealing, addressing anti-Semitism um, will have to be uh, a bipartisan issue, both in, uh, in the States, but in Europe as well. Um, and this goes particularly to modern uh, forms of anti-Semitism. I'm not neglecting or, or uh, undermining the far right or neo-Nazi anti-Semitic uh, narratives, um, but I, I do believe it is safe to say that when there is uh, a far right or neo-Nazi uh, anti-Semitic attack, um, it falls within the consensus. You will find almost no uh, official uh, uh, that will not condemn it. So it falls within the consensus. What we do face a challenge today is with everything that has to do with modern anti-Semitism, and that's mainly anti-Semitism that is connected to Israel, be it you know, anti-Zionism or blaming Jews in diaspora for uh, collectively for uh, the activities of the state of Israel, equating Israel to, to Nazi Germany and so on and so on. And this is, uh, this is exactly what um, the big challenge that we have um, in the broader, more global uh, discourse, which is left versus right, the radicalization on both ends, you know, uh, left that has sort of adopted or claims uh, uh, legitimacy over, you know, addressing anti-Semitism all the while they continue to ignore most of it. And this goes from UK uh, all the way to US and across Europe and so on. Uh, I mean, we, we saw it this week in Israel. One of the biggest headlines in Israel were um, uh, anti Netanyahu demonstrations during which um, Netanyahu and his government were compared to Nazi Germany. I mean, this is happening in Israel. Um, all this to say that the discourse has become so polarized. Um, I do think we will see more of this. But at the same time, I do want to sound also a little bit more optimistic because there's within the government, there is slowly more awareness that um, yes, Israel is also, also part of the anti-Semitism discourse. You can criticize the state of Israel, absolutely, but not all criticism is legitimate and some of it borders uh, anti-Semitism. I think the, um, uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Working Definition uh, is pivotal for this because it's the first uh, intergovernmental and international attempt to uh, bring together all the new anti-Semitism. And it is on us, on all of us, to push and advocate that as many uh, adopt it and implement it because this is the name of the game. By, mere, by having parliaments adopt uh, the working definition, we are merely doing the declarative uh, uh, thing, but we're not really translating it um, into practice. For example, how does a local judge in you know, Melbourne or in Hanover in Germany decide whether uh, an anti-Jewish attack, okay, or attack against the synagogue, this happened a few years ago, is anti-Semitic or not? It happened in Germany that there was an arson attack against the synagogue in one of the German smaller cities, and two Palestinian men were arrested for it. And the judge, in the end, ruled that it was not an anti-Semitic attack. They, the judge ruled in Germany that this was a politically motivated uh, assault uh, because of the 
political frustration of these two Palestinian uh, individuals over the situation in, I don't know, Gaza or whatever it was. Applying, training, judging, connecting the IRA working definition uh, to the legal work uh, would have made a difference. The same goes for police officers or teachers, or yes, in the NGO monitor context, the NGOs. So I think we're, we're in for a bumpy ride. Um, I think a lot of it is not necessarily connected to us, the Jews or Israel, but we will be sort of the collateral damage. Um, but at the same time, we do, with the IRA working definition, we do have the tools, at least, that you know, the IRA working definition was adopted by 34 states. That, that, that's, a, that's an amazing uh, uh, international consensus, and we need to build on that. Thank you, Olga. I'll now like to hand over to Jeremy Jones for the final question. Thank you, Olga. Uh, the World Conference Against Racism, the United Nations World Conference uh, 19 years ago now, yeah. was a place where we saw in action how bad NGOs with a halo effect can be. And one of the lessons that most of us drew from that, there needed to be consequences for anti-Semitism. There needed to be consequences for misuse of funds rather than being consequences for standing up against this sort of misuse by NGOs. We have a question from uh, somebody who's joined us from Britain about the way in which the Charities Commission can't even dissolve charities found financing extremism. There are questions about what stronger legislation could be constructed. Maybe an international agreement is necessary. What can we do? What can we do? What can they do? What can governments do? What can we as individuals do? to try and make sure if NGOs continue to try to be engaged in the activities you've spoken about, what consequences? Um, well, it sort of feeds into a lot of the things that I, um, I, I touched on again, and I, I'll try to uh, uh, you know, put it all together and package it. Um, again, I think that donor governments must have standards. They must have particular requirements, guidelines that, um, that clearly stipulate what is okay and what is not okay. I'll, I'll give you an example of something that, uh, that in which we were involved. Two years ago, Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs introduced uh, new guidelines to particularly their funding to Palestinian NGOs. And the guidelines say, Danish taxpayer money will not go to groups that promote anti-Semitism. It will not go to NGOs that uh, incite to violence, glorify violence, or have any ties to terror, including, and this was this specific, board members who, who are affiliated with uh, terror organizations, employees, workshop participants, and so on and so on. Uh, it, Danish funding will not go to groups that promote BDS. Um, I think in nowadays, uh, we need to be more specific in, uh, in defining clear guidelines because the big challenge is um, who decides, right? What is incitement to violence? What is, what is uh, anti-Semitism? And once you establish that something is uh, anti-Semitic, what is the sanction and how, what do you do about it? So the clearer we get, the clearer that the governments de de um, define their, these guidelines and, and sanctions, the easier um, it will be. I do think that, um, you know, you mentioned the Durban, uh, infamous Durban conference. I do think that we have come a long way. Back then in, in uh, 2001, it was, no, it was beyond anyone's imagination. I mean, you remember, no one even believed the Jewish delegations that this was really happening uh, outside of Durban. No one believed that, that this kind of hateful discourse is even uh, possible from, uh, from major uh, human rights and humanitarian groups. Um, but this is also what inspired Professor Steinberg to, to create that geomonitor. This was exactly his, uh, his motivation, uh, the Durban conference. I do think we have come a long way because more and more governments are um, ready. I'll, I'll, I'll be careful, are ready 
to uh, act upon. Sometimes it takes a really unfortunate and, and fatal uh, uh, event like the murder of Rina Schner, but what it sparked the European Union to, uh, to investigate its funding to Palestinian groups and the Dutch government throws its funding to the Palestinian group and is running an investigation. Uh, was it easy to get them there? No. Um, I think that um, there is slightly more and over time uh, growing um, readiness to look at this more critically. It's not easy because again, these groups come with tremendous uh, public trust, but also incredible political influence. They are brought to, to major discussion tables where policies are discussed. They are usually used as official uh, cons council and advisors to governments in devising development and humanitarian policies in conflict ridden areas, exactly because of their uh, boots on the ground and, and um, experience. Um, uh, I think that um, um, the, uh, the scandals or the examples that have less to do with us, so anti-Semitism or the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be used to help us show that it is not a phenomenon, although it is disproportionate here in, in terms of amounts and how much of political attention is given to the uh, to our little region here and to the uh, conflict, the phenomenon itself is not unique. We have had major international uh, NGOs involved in corruption scandals, sex scandals uh, over the years, um, including World Vision. So it shows the vulnerability and the need in today's world to demand transparency and accountability. Um, coming from the business sector, I always compare, uh, you know, sort of society sectors and I, I split it into three. You have the public sector, you have the private sector, and you have what we call the third sector or the NGO, the civil society. In the first two, um, you have very clear uh, accountability demands, but you also have clear mechanisms in place that are supposed to uh, serve as a remedy in case there is a breach, right? A public official will not be elected if he or she hasn't, uh, hasn't done a good job. Uh, 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 an employee of a government will bear sanctions. The same goes for the companies, the private sector. But when it comes to the, the civil society or the third sector, we have none of that because there, there's sort of a halo, you know, around uh, what they do. And I think this is where we need to uh, be more vocal and say, it is extremely important to have a, a vibrant civil society. The vibrant civil society is the backbone of any democracy, but that is not in contradiction to demanding that they do their job with integrity and accountability and that they can vouch for the partners that they work with. This is not to criticize their work. This is our demands as public to make their work uh, uh, better. Thank you, Olga, and thank you for tonight's presentation. It was truly fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for tonight. I'd like on behalf of Ajak to again thank Olga for her time tonight.